Welcome back. In this video, I'm going to be showing you how we connected to the Nakama server in the Fish Game project. Now, if you've watched the previous video, you'll know that it's very simple to do this. However, in the Fish Game project, we went a little bit further and also implemented some production ready features that I'll show you now. So let's open up our Unity Hub and we will go to the Fish Game project. You should have already downloaded this if you watched the previous video at the start of this course. However, if you haven't, I will leave a link in the description below to take you to the GitHub page where you can download this project. Okay, so with the Fish Game project open, we're going to come down to the Nakama folder here, and you can see we have a Nakama connection script. So again, this is very similar to the way that we did this in our simple project in the last video. However, there's a few key differences with this. So I'm going to open this script in Visual Studio Code. And the first thing you'll see here is that this Nakama connection doesn't inherit from mono behavior. It actually inherits from scriptable object. Just below that, you can see that we also have our four variables, our scheme, host, port, and server key. And we also have some variables here for storing the session and the device's unique identifier in the player prefs object. So, Let's just touch back on this scriptable object. The reason we have this as a scriptable object is that this allows us to create different assets in our game project that allow us to connect to different Nakama servers. So for example, if I come back into the Unity project here, you can see that we have two instances of this Nakama connection. Now I won't click on the heroic cloud one as that is uh, connecting to a production ready Heroic Cloud instance. However, the local Nakama connection here, you can see that at the top right, we have exposed the variables for scheme, host, port, and server key. And that allows us then to use this as an asset that we can pass in as a dependency for other objects in the game to allow them to connect to the Nakama server. We can also come up to the assets menu here within Unity and click create Nakama connection. That's going to allow us to create a brand new Nakama connection asset. You can see here it's got the default values. But for example, we could change this to HTTPS. We could give it a host name. So for example, we could type in example.codewithtom.com. Perhaps that's the host name of the server that we're running. We could pass in a different port number. And perhaps we could pass in a new server key. So this is going to allow us much more flexibility when we're trying to connect to, for example, a local Nakama server or a development Nakama server, or perhaps even the production Nakama server itself, which you can see we have done here with our heroic cloud Nakama connection. And what you would want to do if you were storing this information inside your project is you would probably want to add this file here or something similar to your git ignore so that you're not checking in some secret keys into your repository. So with that being said, let's open up our Nakama connection script here again. And let's just go through some of the code here that's used for connecting to the Nakama server. Now you'll recognize some of this from the previous video. However, there's just a few things in here that I would like to point out that are just a bit more production ready and perhaps something that you might want to consider using in your projects as well. So the first line in this connection function here we do exactly the same as we did in our previous example, where we create a new instance of the Nakama client. We pass in the scheme, the host, port, server key, and our Unity web request adapter. The next thing we do is we try and get our session authentication token from the player prefs object. Now, if the authentication token returns with a value, so it isn't null or empty, then we're going to try and restore that session. So perhaps the user opened the game, they connected to the server, they closed the game, and now they've reopened it again. We've actually stored a reference for that authentication token in the player prefs object, and that allows us then to instantly restore that session if it hasn't already expired. So we say session equals nakama.session.restore, and we pass in the saved authentication token. We then check whether or not the session has already expired. If it hasn't expired, then we're basically saving the value of this session to our session variable at the top of this script. The next thing we do is we check whether or not our session is already has a value. If it doesn't already have a value, then we're going to have to try and authenticate this device and create a new user. 
The next step here is working out whether or not we've already stored our device's unique identifier in the player prefs object. So we're saying if player prefs dot has key device identifier pref name, which is stored up here at the top, Nakama dot device unique identifier. So if we have that key in our player prefs, we're going to get that device ID out of the player prefs object. If we don't have a device ID already stored, then we're going to get our system info dot device unique identifier, which again, you saw in the last video. And we're going to do another check here. So sometimes depending on what device the user is running, the system info dot device unique identifier might not return an actual identifier. What you might get is a null or an NA value returned from that. And that's not very useful. So what we're going to do is we're going to specifically check whether or not the device ID we just got is equal to the system info dot unsupported identifier string. And you can see here, if we hover over it's N slash a. So if our device ID is N slash a, we're just going to generate a brand new device identifier. To do that, we're going to use the system dot GUID dot new GUID function and that will generate a unique identification string. We're then going to store that in our player prefs using the device identifier pref name, and we're going to pass in the device ID that we've just generated. Once we've got our unique device ID, we're going to create a session by authenticating device async. Again, you saw that in the previous video, and then we're going to store the session authentication token in our player prefs. And that's going to allow us to restore the session next time the user launches the game. Finally, we're going to open up a brand new socket and we're just going to connect to that socket using our authenticated session. Again, this is all the same as you saw in the previous video. So by and large, this is very similar to what you've just done in the previous video. However, there are some key things here. The key takeaways being that we try and store the authentication token and restore it if we have one. And also we're going to store our devices identifier and also check whether or not the device identifier is actually supported. If not, we're going to generate our own. Okay, so that's it for this video. In the next one, we're going to take a look at matchmaking. I'll see you there.